Today on Locked On Red Wings, Max Boltman of The Athletic joins us to profile 2023 draft prospect Nate Danielson. You're Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I'm a podcast producer for the Daily J, a WWJ News Radio podcast. Well, Scotty's a host over at Lockdown Tigers as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And on today's episode, we're happy to bring back a uh, friend of the show and just friend in general, Max Boltman of The Athletic. He covers the Red Wings. And uh, Max, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Hey, my pleasure as always, guys. All right, thank you. And then, so... Today, we're going to preview the, or you were going to do a profile rather on Nate Danielson of the Brandon Wheat Kings of the WHL. Um, but before we get to that, I do want to say one hello, Scotty. How are you doing, buddy? <laughs> Happy Friday. <laughs> Happy Friday, man. I'm don't want to forget, right. don't want to forget Scotty's there. Don't want to get him lost in the shuffle. <laughs> um, right. But we do have the drawing for the Robbie Fabry stick giveaway at the end of the episode. That'll be the last thing we do. So ideally you listen through the entire episode, but I'm also well aware you can just scrub through the end if you want, but <laughs> it will be at the end of the episode. And then also um, I want to ask Max here before we get into Nate Danielson, we asked Prashanth and Scotty and I ourselves talked about it. I think on Monday's episode, do you Max deem the season a success for the Detroit Red Wings and by what parameters are you measuring a successful season for the Red Wings? It's kind of funny because I feel like I just wrote this article that was like, they can't have more seasons like this. And they, they came in under what my uh, prediction for standings points was. But I think I have to say that it was still a success. And so I like, I don't know, maybe I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth there. Um, I, I feel like what makes it a success is not so much, obviously, like the standings position. What makes it a success is, I think, two things. Number one, and, and David Perron really talked about this. Andrew Kopp talked about this. Kind of a, a general shift in outlook that took place mainly by way of that February push they had up the standings, put them in a playoff spot. I felt something different around the team um, in that time and certainly around the city and the fan base than I had at any other point in my beat. And I think it was an important difference. It was – almost an eye opening difference for me as someone who's never covered a playoff hockey team of what it actually looks and feels like when a team is alive and in it and feeling that for the first time, I think uh, I, I have to imagine it made every bit as much an impact on the young players who haven't been through that um, as it did, obviously more so they're much more invested in it, but as it did just like catching my attention of, of what that difference was, the presence of that I think is significant. Um, and the other thing I think is, with a new coaching staff, just laying that foundation. D Derek alone has used this kind of analogy of when they got here, they were whatever on the two yard line and now <laughs> on the 50, right? Like he's, he's used yeah. that a couple of times. Yeah. So, uh, and even I think there's doesn't, even if you know, it doesn't we can really quibble. Sense. 50, I don't know, <laughs> but like they're, they're outside the shadow of their own goal line. They're, they're maybe on the 40, right? They, they're still, uh, you know, you're on the 50, like you, you're probably getting points. On this <laughs> you're almost right. a field goal, right? Yeah, exactly. Days, like, right? I don't know, but, uh, they made huge progress, right? So, and I think that that's accurate. I think setting up that defensive uh, system um, that they did and, and it working was great. Uh, I, I think they made huge strides. They're going to have to add to that next year in terms of the uh, finding a way to still get offense with that system. But I think setting that foundation was really important. So I think uh, I think it was a success, even even though I think hopefully they don't redo it again for their sake, right? But I think uh, I think that is. Well, yeah, I, and we're Brian and I are in the same boat, and and, and Prashanth was kind of in the same boat too. I, I think most people we've talked to have said like, yeah, you know, they didn't like blow it out of the water or anything, but like, yeah, you know, like it was probably a success. I when when looking, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but like when looking at this is a vital off season, like this is a a, a massive off season for the direction of this franchise, and just. Obviously, specific players and whatnot is impossible to predict. But in a in a general sense, what 
then makes the summer a success? Like we just had a successful season. What makes the summer a success so that we're setting ourselves up nicely for the fall of like, hey, we, last year was a great step in the right direction. Everybody's really happy with the summer. Now like rubber meets the road. Let's go whatever, like make the playoffs or whatnot. It's a good question. Uh, I I think what makes the offseason a success is they bring in a legit top six score. People can quibble with me, top line score, whatever. They need someone who can score 25 goals or more. I guess that's right. a top line score. Mm-hmm. They need a twenty a top line score. Um, I think they need to add a little bit of uh, muscle. Steve Weisman says he doesn't want to bring someone in to beat people up. I think that's fine. But there has to be a little more uh, edge to the team next year than there was this year. Some of it can come internal, just like with scoring. Some of it also, I think, has to come external. And I think obviously the draft's a huge part of it. I don't know how much we could even belabor that. Like nail yeah. the draft. Like I, I, it's way easier for me to say than do, but do it right. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got five picks in the top forty-five. <laughs> That's the reason why, right? Like you, yeah. have, you have so many avenues you can use those picks to do. You don't even have to draft people. You can use them as leverage and other stuff. So totally. So uh, yeah, th- those are kind of the pillars for me. I mean, it, you know, w- whatever. I, I think you probably have to to trade for that scorer. Um, easier said than done. Now. I'm sure you guys are watching this Leaf series and this Jet series as closely as I am. Yeah. Those are two highly combustible situations with really good players. They have multiple guys who who could fit that category. And if those teams go out in the first round, fireworks, right? Like they're going to – I think stuff's going to be on the table. So that's going to be fascinating. But there's other guys out there too. And, uh, you know, the brink has been the hot name lately. Yeah. Um, you know, Arizona, I think people always are going to bring up Arizona's players anytime there's a situation like that. Jersey obviously has the two RFAs and Brat and Meyer that it looks like it's going to be an either or there. I think it's probably going to be a trade. And I think whatever that trade would come out to be would have a huge role in the offseason. Now, if they can't do it via trade, that's what I'm kind of curious for, for you guys. Like, what if they go in here and their, their biggest addition is like Alex Kalorn or Jason Zucker? Um, those are good players, but like, I don't know how you can expect to necessarily go into the playoffs at, at that point, right? Well, yeah, I, I just think that it's uh, just from a sales standpoint to the fan base is my biggest thing. And like, I'm sure, you know, as someone on the beat, like that's your biggest thing too, right? Like yeah. turning like turning around and, and, and uh, selling that to the fan base, whether it's the front office or whatever, that – um, you know, like this is this, these are the additions that are going to kind of carry us over the edge. I agree with you. I think that that's a, I think that that's a, a tough sell despite them being, you know, good players. Prashanth yeah. brought up a good point too. Uh, he, he said a name on, was it Wednesday's episode that we had him on Scotty that yeah. I hadn't even thought about, but it is comes from that Winnipeg team, that combustible situation that you brought up Max and Kyle Connor, yeah. a Michigan yeah. native, uh, mid twenties already signed a long-term extension with a few years left. No trade clause not, does not have a no trade clause and has like, I think four 30 goal seasons and one 40 goal season already under his beneath his belt. Like he kind of fits that bill immediately. So you, you are, like you said, Max, keeping your eye right on that Winnipeg yeah. jet situation in case you're, you know, you're trying to acquire that school score, which I think everyone in the fan bases that we've spoken to is in agreement that that's the next step you need. And that trading is the logical way of doing it because, you know, and Eisman's even said himself, you know, he wants a guy who is a proven commodity. He doesn't like your drafts great, but you don't know what you're getting. So he'd rather have players rather than picks. Yeah. He has said that. And I think uh, when he, when he first started saying that right at the deadline, it, 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 it didn't catch for me. Like I was just like, what, then why are you trading proven commodities for the picks? Right. But it's yeah. obviously the contract situation is the answer to that question. But I just meant like, you know, I don't know. There was something about it that wasn't squaring for me right away. But I think basically if you came out of this and you were to trade for, let's use your guy, Kyle Connor, right? I put him in one of my articles earlier this week too. If you were to use the pick that they got for Tyler Bertuzzi, which was the Bruins first rounder and one of those second rounders and one of their prospects or whatever, and they turn Tyler Bertuzzi, a second rounder and a prospect into like a Kyle Connor. That's a huge successful trade, right? That's really good remaneuvering of these assets, an expiring contract of a really good player, you know, a couple of like valuable pick slash prospects that aren't game change, whatever. Like that's, that's really good asset usage. So I think that's what, the more I think about it, that's what makes a lot of sense. And I, I agree at this point in the, the arc, you want the proven commodity. I, I think that patience is finally starting to wear thin amongst Red Wings fans. Um, it took a long time to get there. And Steve Eisenman has a long leash and he has a proven track record, even with Red For Wings, sure. on making the right decisions, even when they're tough pills to swallow. Like 
the Jacob Verana trade. I, you know, he finished the season really hot with the St. Louis Blues, but it's hard to criticize him for that trade. It's hard to criticize him for the Tyler Bertuzzi trade, despite the fact that it's a tough pill to swallow. So there, and the, I think the trades that he has kind of whiffed on have been low risk more than anything. So it, it's patience is beginning to wear thin, but not, he hasn't done anything yet. So egregious yet that people are really starting to question, you know, what he can do. But I think if he goes and comes out of this offseason with really nothing to show for it, right wing stands are going to really start to wonder what the direction of this team is. It's just an interesting, cause you know, people have asked me at various times, like, you know, at what point would he be on the, and I don't, we're not there. Like we're, we're not, not there yet. No. Hot seat, but like, it's just a matter of like that. I covered Jim Harbaugh at Michigan and <laughs> at various times there, you know, the seat's not like it was on Jim Harbaugh at Michigan, even after four years, but there's plenty of parallels in what it's like to have kind of like a program franchise icon who has had success at, you know, whatever this next level is coaching and, and for Harbaugh managing for Iserman come in and you, you do just get more, leeway Mm -hmm. but as we saw with harbaugh it's not infinite leeway and as we also saw with harbaugh even when the hot seat ratcheted up it didn't actually mean that like it was impossible he just turned in the best two years of the program's head in like 20 you know 20 years right so uh you just beat one team twice and everybody was fine (laughs) (laughs) sometimes the margin's that thin right right? like (laughs) right 2016 uh, I was at that Michigan Ohio State game that year, and you know that how that game was viewed was the difference between Harbaugh being deemed a failure right. for like the next three years, uh, and and you know not having any any worries. I don't think you know the Red Wings are obviously are not at, even at the level that that Michigan team was, but in terms of where the rebuild is going, it's not as instant gratification, right? Like you've gotten Mo Sider, Lucas Raymond, Simon Evans. Give us a couple years. And let's let's evaluate that. The seat's not hot yet, but it's not a heat proof seat either. Right. And so yeah. it's always going to be kind of that fine line to walk. Absolutely. Uh, so when we come back, we'll get into the conversation on Nate Danielson. Um, but before we get to that, I got to talk to you guys today about eBay Motors for a championship team. It's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors with eBay guaranteed fit you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to My Garage and look for the green check to know you your part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Good job, Brian. Thanks, buddy. Segment two, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. He's saying good job, Max, because <laughs> whenever I read Let's Ride, I, I read it in Russell Wilson's voice. Let's ride. <laughs> yeah. And I can't get through it without laughing. So that was a that was a first right there. That's impressive. Uh, segment two, Lockdown Red Wings po- uh, podcast. We are going to get into now the prospect profile of Nate Danielson. Most places, most publications have him falling um, somewhere between the, I would say, 12 to 20 range. Most mock drafts, he's six foot one, 185 pounds. He's a center that plays for the Brandon Wheat Kings. He's the captain of the Brandon Wheat Kings. As of this season, he had 78 points in 68 games played, uh, 33 goals, 45 assists. And he is, for what it's worth, a right-handed shot, which the Red Wings don't have a whole lot of. Max, when I came to you and asked you to do a prospect profile, you brought up two names, Oliver Moore and Nate Danielson. Unfortunately, Prashant had already called dibs on Oliver Moore, so we defaulted to talking about Nate Danielson in this episode. What has really drawn your attention to Nate Danielson as a guy that the Red Wings could be looking at here with potentially the ninth and potentially, hopefully, the 18th? If it falls any later than that, you'll be seeing me going red. But what draws you to Nate Danielson? Yeah, a, a few things. Number one, I think he has a, a mix of traits that tend to be of, of interest to the Red Wings, right? He's a, a big right shot center who skates well and competes well. And I think right off the top, you should be hearing some things and some little signals in your head. Okay, this is a guy to pay attention to. Um, you know, Like you said, he's, he's a captain for the Wheat Kings, but I think it, it, when people hear the profile, they think, okay, another like two-way forward. And number one, I think people kind of undervalue what the what the how hard it is to get two way forwards. 
But this is a player with legit offense and, and legit skill. And I, I think if you were to bring him into the Red Wings pipeline, I think he's probably pretty similar caliber of prospect to Marco Casper last year. Um, and, and even some similar rhyme in, in those traits. Now, uh, always difficult to compare head to head with a guy who's played in a junior league to a guy who's playing in a pro league. And that is the case in, in this instance. Um, but when you watch Nate Danielson, you just see a really complete game. A guy who shift to shift is giving you exactly what you want. He was not on a very good team. And I wonder if his offensive numbers wouldn't be even better um, if he was on a different team in the Western Hockey League. Um, but I just think it's a it's a huge, you know, strong mix of traits there. Um, and, and so when I look at what the Red Wings target, that's kind of he kind of has a little bit of everything. If you had questions about him, you might say, OK, what is like the ultimate, you know, ceiling in terms of the production it's a fair question but i do think there's real offense in there um and and i think he, he shows skill I mean, you, you don't have to look at watch his tape long to see really impressive offensive traits already um he's not Connor bedard but we're talking about you know the ninth pick here not the first pick and, and that's kind of the difference for sure well i i think that's kind of along the lines of the the question i wanted to ask you was you know we we look at players and when they're viewed at as you know like complete all-around players uh, sometimes I feel like the the best and worst traits can kind of get lost in the shuffle. What's like the one thing I guess he hangs his hat on? What's the what is, is it like offensive? Do you think that it is on the offensive side? Is he you know two way? It's more of a defensive forward type. Like what is what is the the one skill or trait I guess that you would say is the most impressive to you? I do think it's the all around and and from doing this for five years, I know that there's listeners right now who hear that and go, Oh great. It's the all around. Right. <laughs> but some of the, let me just give you like, when I've talked to, when we did, we just did this like prospect profile, uh, like overview primer series on, on uh, the athletic hockey show prospect series that I do with Corey Pronman and a couple of the names that he's mentioned is kind of like in the ballpark of, of what to think of here, Elias Lindholm and Dylan cousins. And both of those guys went in the top seven of the NHL draft. They both immediately became, I mean, Lindholm, I think, took until he was like 24 to hit that like real like, you know, 1C fringe area. But Dylan Cousins is already there. Um, If he falls somewhere in that range and you're getting a a two way center with size, skating, competitiveness, who's going to give you 40 to whatever number points, you're really happy. How much are you paying on the open market to get a player like that? It's whatever you just gave Andrew Kopp Um, and Andrew Kopp's, you know, career high was like 50 points. Right. So, Mm -hmm. you know. To be able to get a guy who has the upside to be a lot more than that, to get him on an ELC, to get him in the draft, like that's a really useful piece. And that's why guys like this go where they do in the draft. This is what Corey and I talked about is they're the pieces that are so hard to find. You can usually find a guy who just brings you scoring, right? You can find Andreas Athanasiu. You can find Mike Hoffman, whatever. Go look at what those guys put up in terms of point totals. They're like not bad at all. And and Andreas Athanasiu has been a 30 goal scorer in the NHL. Mike Hoffman puts up numbers every year but you can always get him because it's never that hard to find a, a guy who just kind of scores from the wing. When you talk about a guy with a complete game who can do a lot of different things, who can help you win um, with offense and defense. I think when you, when you say two ways, sometimes people think that you just mean defense. I mean, both Nate Danielson has both. And I think that's what makes him a really valuable player. And that you would, you would argue that that's his biggest asset is his two way playability. It's, it's just it's, the completeness, right? It's, 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 it's not so much like, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like it, it's, it's that the, there's an overall package here that like he's going to bring offense. He's going to be able to check for you. He's going to win face off. He's just going to do all these things all over the ice to help you. I, I think that's pretty similar. I, what did I say last year when we did Casper skating? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. So like, I don't think he's quite Casper's level as a skater, but he's a good skater. Uh, I, I think there's real skill and I think it's just the completeness. I think the completeness is the answer. And I know it's probably the one that's going to drive people crazy. So, you know, speaking of Casper, it'd be crazy if two years in a row, the guy we profile with you, the Red Wings, are the guy <laughs> I was going to say that at the end, I was going to be like, I don't know. This is looking good. Maybe this is where the money goes. Yeah. <laughs> so if you, anyone's listening and you, you can put a futures down on who the Red Wings pick, you know, Max is one for one. So well, far. there's a few guys, right? Like there's a few guys I could say, right? I thought about, we talked about Ryan Leonard. That's who I mocked to them in my mm-hmm. first mock draft. Uh, I think Colby Barlow has a real case to, to be their guy. Those two guys are both kind of power wingers. Um, just in my experience, I think if you can get that center, you do it. And it's it's especially hard the later you go in the in the draft. And I think they're only going to get later in terms of where they're picking in the draft in the coming years. It, it's going to get harder for them to find the centers. Um, I, they have two good centers. They have Larkin and Casper. But if they can get another one here, I think it would serve them very well. But, you know, Barlow, Leonard, like I said, like, like you said, I, I uh, threw more out there before I knew Prashant had done him. Like those would be kind of my big four right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so when we come back, Scotty, uh, we'll continue this conversation. We, I have a few more questions. 
Um, so yeah, stay tuned to Lockdown Red Wings. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Uh, Scotty, before I get to my next question, you got anything? Um, I mean, I do, <laughs> but if we, I mean, if we're doing like a ping pong back and forth thing, then you're up. Am but, I? Yeah. <laughs> oh well, okay. Well then. <laughs> um, let's see here. The, you you mentioned the um the team need and that center would serve them well to get another center. But would you list that as like the number one need that this team has? I know in the draft you take the best player available, but when you're assessing this Red Wings team's positional needs the most, and we talked about it in segment one, this team needs a score. Um, really, a guy who can put consistently over 30 bucks in the back of the net. Yep. Is this the guy who fits that need? Is this even the biggest need the Red Wings have? Well, I don't, I, like I said, I think he can score. Um, you know, I, I think the biggest need the Red Wings have is, like you said, scoring, but it's also like, if we're talking positionally, it's right shot D, but I don't see a right shot D uh, unless David Reinbacher were to fall to them. I don't see a right shot D who, who's going to be what they need him to be, be on the board at their pick. I don't really see David Reinbacher being there at nine. Um, I'm not sure Nate Danielson's going to be there at nine. I know you talked about him 12 to 20. It would not shock me if he's gone before they pick uh, at nine. So, We'll see, but um, no, I don't think that that center is any longer the like top need in, in the system. I think it was last year when they took Casper. I think he decreased that need. But to me, I, I it goes back to what I said in the last segment of like, to me, what you use your draft picks for are the things that you don't think you can find anywhere but the draft. It's why I thought picking you know Edvinson where they picked him made a lot of sense, even though I know that were you know it wasn't at the time unanimous that a D was, was the answer there. There was a lot of people who wanted, whether it was William Eklund or uh, I guess Brent Clark is also a D, but uh, you know, those are some of the popular pictures. I think Eklund was the one the fans really wanted, yeah. but the same deal at the time, right? Where else are you finding a six, six D who can skate, handle the puck? Like you're just not. Uh, and, and unless you're going to draft them. And I think that's true of centers too. It's centers and D are, are the guys that you just, okay, great. You need a right shot D. So does everybody else. Great. You need a two way right shot center with some size. So does everybody else. Uh, you need a winger. Okay. You can do that on free agency. Vladimir Tarasenko is a free agent this year. Uh, Patrick Kane is going to be a free agent this year. These guys are old. I get Tyler it. Bertuzzi. Like, Tyler Bertuzzi is going to be a free <laughs> agent this year. Uh, I get it. They're, they're older guys um, and, and past their primes in some cases, but anytime you need to trade for or sign a winger, you can do that. If you need to trade for a young productive center, good luck. Go go call Buffalo. Ask him what it would cost to get Dylan Cousins right now. It's not happening. You might be able to trade for uh, Elias Lindholm right now, but you get my point. <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. I, I, I guess I, I also want to ask just your – uh, widely being considered this draft is like a, a not only a very top heavy draft, obviously with Bedard and Fantilli and whatnot, but um, like a really, really deep draft where a lot of these dudes are, are going to go in places where if they were drafted any other year would be a lot higher. Just is that the, the, I don't know. I don't want to just ask you like, is that the same vibe you get, but like talk about this draft class as a whole and kind of your opinion on it, I guess. So Corey and I talk about this all the time on the show. And I think Steve Eiserman made a comment about it the other yeah. day at the end of season that was really telling, really in line with what Corey has always said. And so I'm just going to second those two very smart hockey people and say, uh, usually when you talk about how deep a draft is, it's because there are two or three or however many people at the very top that bump what is otherwise a normal draft class down by that many spots, right? So, or, or it's just really because you're talking about the top, right? You might get Mavi Michkov at four this year. That's crazy, right? You might get him at five if someone's scared of the Russia thing. Um, so that's kind of what people mean. And in that way, it's really deep. There's two or three or maybe four, depending on your view, special prospects at the top. Um, I personally would probably say three, but I think, you know, there's where does Yuri Slavkovsky go in this draft? Probably three, four, five, like, yeah. right. Like, and he was the number one pick last year. So in that way, it's deeper. I don't know that the player you're getting at nine this year, last year it was Matt Savoy. I, they're probably a little better, but by the time we get to 11, 12, we're talking about the same, the same caliber here. Sure. Um, you know, last year, uh, Pavel Minchikov went, I think 10 to Anaheim. I love Pavel Minchikov. He might be the best D in this class you know, depending on your, your mileage, right. Whether you like him or Reinbacher, but he might've been the best D in this class. Uh, and you know, he went 10 last year. So it, I think it, it, it can kind of get overblown sometimes. Uh, but 
because there's those two or three really awesome guys at the top, I think you probably maybe one or two spots better than sure. where you might otherwise get somebody. And so when it comes to, I want to go back to Nate Danielson a little bit here because I have one more question about yeah. him. When we talked about the United States national team development program players, you know, that being more Leonard para a pro rather and Will Smith, the consensus was those guys are projected top, uh, for top uh, first round picks, rather some of them top 10 picks, but they won't be ready this year. They might not even be no. ready next year. Nate Danielson playing out of the WHL is, is the timeline similar? It's going to take a year or two, or could you see a situation where he pulls a Lucas Raymond and makes a team out of camp or even a Marco Casper where at the end of his first, uh, his D plus one year, he's right there with the Red Wings. And unfortunately Casper's season ended the way it did, but he would have played out the season if he had not gotten hurt. Yeah, it, it does help that he's an older player, so he's a year older. I'm, I think he'd probably do another year in the WHL. But you know, if if, if that season ends early, it would not shock me to see him do what Casper did and uh, ideally not get injured right away and be able to do a few more games of it. Um, so no, that would not surprise me at all. Um, just partly because he is that year older. Now, when we talk about that, that is another drawback that I think people can point to, and it is completely valid. Of okay, this guy is a. September birthday, uh, uh, late September birthday, which means he was just a couple weeks from going from being eligible for last year's draft. And how does that weigh, especially when we talk about this production thing, right? Like I think his production is good. It's not far off what Dylan Cousins did in Dylan Cousins' draft year. It's also not even close to what like Zach Benson is doing, who's a player that we haven't even talked about um, in the WHL for this draft, who I know a lot of fans love. It's not close to what Andrew Crystal is doing, who's a prospect that I'm not particularly that excited about on tools wise. But why is he able to produce like that in the in the Western League? And those, these are fair questions. If, if you're going to nitpick Nate Danielson, this is what it's on. But I still think if you look at the overall, you know, what is it to put up? I think he's at like 1.2 or so points per game uh, in the Western Hockey League. Like that's still a really good uh, production level. And I think it wouldn't scare me off too much. But if you're nitpicking, it's it's OK. He's only you know, he, he's almost a whole year uh, past you know, or he's, a, you know, whatever he's at the older end of this draft sure. class and the production is what it is. Well, and while, while we're nitpicking that also affect his eligibility for a slide, if they do, yeah. uh, he'd obviously be able to slide this year, but coming into next year, he wouldn't be able to, cause he'd turn 20 cause slides only eligible for 18 and 19 year olds. Correct. Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. So that you'd get one potential year of entry level contract slide if that's the dis if that's the route the writings were to go. But then again, like you said, Max, that's nitpicking. <laughs> and I don't think you're you're making your draft decision on who you can slide. It also yeah. might mean because he's that old, he might be ready sooner than like you know True. Casper was a. Uh, oh, Casper is going to be ready pretty quick. But I'm trying to think of like you know Edvinson and Raymond were like April birthdays, right? March and April birthdays, February. I don't know. They're, they're spring birthdays. Um, maybe you're hoping that because he's you know. A year, six months, whatever, more physically advanced. Maybe he gets the NHL six months quicker. I don't know. But typically, I, I do get a little gun shy on the older prospects. But you know what? So is Adam Fantilli. So is, uh, so is, uh, is Leo Car I think Leo Carlson is too. Like, there's going to be really good players in this draft who are late birthdays. Fair enough. <laughs> <clears throat> Scotty, you got anything else? I don't have anything else on uh, mm -hmm. on him unless you do, Brian. Uh, not, on, not on Danielson, though. No. So do you have any – while we have Max want to pick his brain questions? Um, I mean, I kind of asked mine earlier, I guess, just about like the, the upcoming off season and whatnot. Um, I, I mean, if we want to really jump like way far ahead and start talking about like next season, I, I don't want to say, uh, I don't want to ask you for like expectations. Cause obviously again, we have a whole off season to figure out what, uh, you know, how they're going to fill certain holes on the team. But, um, you know, we talk about that angst, like within yep. the fan base and kind of what they're expecting going forward. Um, what do you do you think it's like a playoff or bust mentality not for you necessarily but like for the fan base do you yeah. think that there's a lot of fans out there that like if they don't make the playoffs next year that's just kind of like that that's a big failure and then you know as you said like the the heat may the seat maybe gets a little bit hotter i think no but i think there has to be a step toward that right like if you look at buffalo season this year yeah. yes they were in it till the very end. They did not make the playoffs, but I don't think you'd find anyone around Buffalo who said, who would say that that season's a failure. Right. Now it's only going to keep getting harder. Like I think people have this idea that because teams like Pittsburgh and Washington are toward the cliff and, you know, missed the playoffs this year. And, you know, we'll see what happens with Boston in a post Bergeron post Krejci world that there's just this lane there for you to now fill. It, it's just going to keep getting harder 
you know, I was having this conversation uh, with somebody a while back and this is like Montreal is closer on your tail than you'd like to admit for a team that only really started rebuilding a couple years ago. Like it's, it's going to have to take a little bit of stepping on the gas, but I still don't think we're at the point yet that you're talking about of like, you know, the seat starts to get hot if you don't make the playoffs next year. But I do think you need to take a real step next year. And boy, I know that's a lot, leaves a lot of gray area on either side to parse. You know, are we looking for a point total? I think you get to, if you get to 90 next year, it's a 10 point improvement. You're right there on the cusp of the playoffs. I think you got to be happy. Um, But am I going to sit here if they get 88 points and a lot of things go right, but they have, injuries at the wrong time and say this franchise is is going the wrong way no of course not but yeah. I, 90 would be kind of where i would set the the target for next year i guess awesome uh so scotty i think it's time we should do our our drawing for the robbie fabry stick sure. giveaway i have it i have them all here i so <laughs> we we opened it up this time to facebook instagram and twitter so i had to physically write down everybody who entered and then put it in this pistons hat because somebody's got to win something wearing a pistons logo at some point so that's how long do you think of that one dude uh about it took me about 10 minutes to think of a good joke so, <laughs> okay um, cool yeah i was wondering oh no a couple of them fell out let me put those back in there all right, let's do this. Somebody give me a drum roll. I, you're not going to be able to hear it. Well, maybe I'll edit in post. Who am I kidding? I'm too okay. lazy for that. Yeah, for sure. All right, all right, all right. Let's 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 pull uh, let's pull one out here. I'm not looking. I'm looking at Scotty. It is a Twitter user. I have their, at, their username down here as at jmessic16. That's at jme16. S E C 16. So congratulations to you. And if you are listening, DM us on Twitter because clearly you're on Twitter and we can sort out how to get you this Robbie Fabry hockey stick. Uh, Thanks to everyone who participated. It was a week and a long week and a half that we made you guys wait. I know, but (laughs) the winner is finally here and it is over with. Um, Good news for you guys. His Twitter picture, he's got an American flag pin in, so I don't think you're going to have to pay for international shipping. (laughs) That was that was something we're going to have to be careful of next time. That's uh, yeah, that is that is a nice um, nice on the wallet for sure. We we shipped the last one down to like Alabama or Georgia, and it was already more than I had anticipated. I was not expecting that. It's because not because it's heavy, because it's awkwardly like shaped. You need like a unique box, and that costs money, man. So, um. Anyways, Max, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. I always enjoy it, man. Absolutely, fellas. My pleasure, and uh, we'll do it again soon. Yeah, do you have anything you want to plug? I mean, obviously, you're with The Athletic, and you sometimes host that athletic podcast. Yeah, uh, Athletic Hockey Show Prospect Series with Corey Promman. It's a good time of year for that. And obviously, if anybody wants to subscribe to The Athletic, uh, my Twitter handle is at M underscore Boltman. Click on any of those links, and if you want to subscribe, uh, that would be tremendous. No more checkmark for you, though. No, no more check mark for me. So I guess if you want to start a, a Max Boltman impersonator account, now is your now is your time. <laughs> Don't tempt people, man. <laughs> Don't tempt people. Just just be nice about it. That's all I ask. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see what Prashant tweeted today? He said, "Now that my verify check mark's gone, I need to admit that this is just an Iser Rohan burner account." <laughs> <laughs> that was great. All right. Uh, again, Max, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, um, Scotty. What do we do? We ball. We ball. We'll be back with a new episode on Monday, lining it up to have Sam McGilligan on for another prospect profile as we are making sure we get through all of these before the draft happens. So stay tuned for that. Same time, same place, your team every day. Every day.